Hello fellow moviegoers, and welcome to a new episode of Movie Dome, where I'm going to be giving you my thoughts on the recent Illumination Entertainment animated film, The Super Mario Brothers Movie. And as you might have, as you might have guessed, I brought Mario himself into the video. He says a hello. Now, so spoilers ahead for those who have not seen the film yet. You might want to go and click on something else to watch that. But for those who have, you're welcome to stay aboard. The Super, the Super Mario Brothers movie is a computer-generated movie put out by Illumination Entertainment and Universal Pictures. Based on the video game series of the same name and has an all-star cast featuring Chris Pratt as the man himself Mario alongside The likes of And I'm not kidding here Seth Rogen as Bowser So a little bit of the uh, snop, uh, synopsis Mario and Luigi are two um, are two failing plumbers who have left Spike, their employer, to start their own plumbing business. And on their first call, they end up bursting all the pipes in their client's house. And when they go down into the sewers, they are sucked through a magic pipe into the Mushroom Kingdom. And this is where the adventure begins, as Luigi ends up in the Darklands, kidnapped by Bowser, and Mario enlists the help of Princess Peach, Toad, who actually enlists himself into the crew, and Donkey Kong, to venture into the Darklands to rescue Luigi. And what that then culminates is an adventure that basically ends up as a race down <laughs> uh, the Rainbow Way, which is a course in Mario Kart. Throughout the film, we see him jumping on platforms and gaining power-ups, as seen in the games. And to make the film absolutely true to the games, they actually have the help of the game's creator. Yes, this is the same production company who gave us such films as Despicable Me, Minions and The Secret Life of Pets. But being the third film of theirs I've actually seen this is their magnum opus, their greatest work that I've seen so far. So, uh, now you might be wondering, if I'm not a fan of the games, how can I be a fan of the film? The same reason that I'm a fan of other game-based movies. 
I'm a bit familiar with the characters and I love the story. Now, without wanting to spoil how the rest of the film goes for you guys, I'm actually going to stop giving you the synopsis here and give you my opinion. Wait, I think I just did. Mario is looking at me now like you a plonker. I've just said this is the best film I've seen from Illumination Entertainment out of the three that I've currently seen. This is their 13th film, by the way. <laughs> and what an amazing film for them to make as their 13th one. And this is actually supposed to be the start of a Nintendo Cinematic Universe. Because the creator of the Zelda games has already expressed an interest due to Mario's success on the big screen in making a film based on the Zelda games. So guys, let me know in the comments below what you thought of Super Mario Brothers the movie. Because I would like to know. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. And until the next video, thanks for watching and have us a magical time. Hiya, and welcome back to some Magical Reviews. I thank you for your patience, and it is now time for another TV review. But I'm not going to be reviewing a whole TV show this time, but rather one season of a TV show. Yes, no, maybe... Can you repeat the question? You're not the boss of me now. Yeah, that's right. All those clues point you in the direction of Malcolm in the Middle. The complete first season from 2000. So, the blurb on the back first. Is it me or is my life starting to get weird? Here's what I did this week. I ate waffles with my, while my dad had his back shaved. I found out I had an IQ of 165. I threw chocolate pudding in a guy's face. I yelled at a kid in a wheelchair. I got transferred to a new class. And somewhere in there, my butt got dipped in red paint. That's normal, right? So, based on that little blurb alone, you can already tell that Malcolm Wilkerson, played by Frankie Muniz, is the middle child and, and prodigy of this dysfunctional family 
And because he learns early in the series, in fact in the first episode, that he has an IQ of 165, he is transferred to the gifted class at his school, known, not so affectionately, as the Krellboins. And basically what the word Krellboin is, is an insult um, towards smart people in this show. And the first kid in this class of friends is a, a boy named Stevie who is in a wheelchair and so he, yes that's right he's a paraplegic asthmatic and Malcolm is unhappy about being transferred to the gifted class because it now makes him one of them over 16 episodes you get to see the misadventures of the Wilkerson's as Malcolm tries to navigate his way through the Krellboin class while also being selfish about a funeral and a pain in the neck at a water park you know the book standard stuff a smart kid has to deal with He lives in this family with his dad, Hal, his mom, Lois, his older brother, Francis, who's away at military academy, his direct older brother before him, Reese, and their younger brother, Dewey. And. There's a little known fact. Now, for those of you who are fans of Breaking Bad, you might recognize, or you may not, the actor playing Hal. Because if you never saw this, but went straight on to seeing that, Hal is played by none other than Walter White himself, Brian Cranston. No, I'm not kidding. That is him. And also, yeah, this is done by 20th Century Fox. Um, so, do any of you guys out there in the US have this on your Disney Plus? Well, guys, I would tell you who plays the other characters, but there's no cast listing. But this is a brilliant season and a great way to kick off your journey through Malcolm in the Middle. Now guys, if you have seen this, let me know in the comments what you thought below. And I will be giving you reviews of the other six seasons once I get and see them.
But until then, guys. That's it for this episode. If you enjoyed the video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching. And until next time, have a magical time. Hello fellow moviegoers and calling all dads out there, happy Father's Day. This is a review for you. 2009 film, A Boy Called Dad. Now, if you've never heard of this film, allow me to describe the plot. It is the story of a young, of a 14 year old boy named Robbie, played by Kyle Ward who, after a clumsy encounter with a classmate at a bus shelter, um, becomes a father to a young a baby boy named Elliot. And because of this, then he ends up meeting his own father again and having sort of good, bad experiences with him and learning about why he was abandoned as an infant by this sorry excuse of a father that he doesn't want to be the same kind of father to his own child and now the mother wants nothing more to do with him at this point so what does he do well he has an altercation with his ex's current partner who is pretending to be the baby's father uh, snatches his baby boy and goes on the run so yes, he's now on the run with his baby son and he finds just how hard it is to look after a baby. And this is also another reason why you shouldn't ever get to the point of becoming a parent while you're still a child yourself. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs>
sorry. But if you've seen the film yourself, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Here in Great Britain, anyway. <laughs> uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe. And... Thanks for watching, have us a magical time. Hello fellow moviegoers, and welcome back to some magical reviews for our 24th episode. And we're heading into the high fantasy world created by Tolkien here for this next review. Now I'm not going to review the book alongside it, it's just the film this time. Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring was released in 2001 into cinemas and I'm sure lots of you know the story already it's the story of the adventures of a hobbit named Frodo Baggins who is sent on the quest for the one ring to destroy it to find and destroy it and joining him on this quest, he has a whole fellowship consisting of his best friend Samwise, who is a fellow hobbit, Gandalf the Grey, who I think actually sends him on the quest, he's the wizard, and a whole bunch of elves. They're banding together to go on this mystical magical quest across Middle Earth which will actually take them to Sauron's lair in Mordor and this was the first film release for the Middle Earth saga now the theatrical cut of the film only runs about two and a half hours, maybe three. But the extended cut is the one you want to see. It goes on for over four hours. And gives you everything you need to see for that first part of the journey. It is an epic adventure through and through. And it's awesome. Just simply awesome. And now guys, this will be a film that's near and dear to many of your hearts. Let me know what you thought though in the comments below. And for those who are new, I should have issued a spoiler warning. But I didn't give away the ending, so we're good.
Well, that's it for this episode of some magical reviews. You'll know by next time what I'm going to be reviewing next. As that's when I'm going to know. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching and have us a magical time. And take that ring off! Hi guys, and welcome back to some Magical Reviews for our silver episode. That's right, episode 25 guys, wow, no. Um, and what am I reviewing for episode 25? Oh, oh, back to the Simpsons, but an entire season this time. We're travelling all the way back to season 1, 1989 through 1990. The first ever season of the cartoon which would surely become a hit after its initial 13 episodes. That's right, 13 episodes in this season and sorry about that and all very much so very early Simpsons classics at their finest. Well, um, in terms of story and stuff, but so what happens throughout this season? Well, in Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire, which is the initial episode of the series and kind of at a, as its pilot, so to speak. The Simpsons Family Christmas is almost ruined when Homer doesn't receive his Christmas bonus and Bart gets a tattoo with Mother on it thinking Marge would like it and she has to spend all the family's Christmas money having the tattoo surgically removed. While Homer gets a part-time job at the mall working as a Santa to try and make money for Christmas. But instead, because they only paid him out $13, they go to the Springfield Downs dog racing stadium and end up adopting Santa's little helper. That's a pretty solid first episode of a series, wouldn't you say? In Bart the Genius, Bart fakes, that's right, Bart fakes his intelligence level by cheating on an IQ test. And ending up with a score of 216, he's ended up, he ends up being sent to a school for gifted children, even though he's no gifted child by his intellect, which he has hardly any of. Because the, uh, the, the paper he switched for his was Martin's. Yes, Martin Prince. In Homer's, uh, um, uh, is a passable second episode, should I say. You don't need a high IQ to watch that. <laughs> okay. In Homer's Odyssey, after Homer loses his job to Bart distracting him on a field trip, he has to go far and wide to find a new job. 
only to land up as safety inspector back at the place he first lost his job, the nuclear power plant. Well, if you let this episode distract you from your work, you're fired. <laughs> um, <laughs> in this no disgrace like home, Homer takes his family to a company picnic where he himself winds up being embarrassed by his family's behaviour. So he takes them to family therapy and this is where we're introduced to Dr. Marvin Munro for the first time. And needless to say, the family therapy doesn't go well. For Homer at least, because this family sees him as an ogre. Not too far off from his behaviour though, is it? So... Well, and don't be embarrassed by this episode because it's still a good one. So, in Bart the General, Bart is being bullied by Nelson months after defending Lisa from one of Nelson's cronies. This is Nelson's first appearance in the show as well. And so he goes and gets help from Grandpa Simpson, whose first appearance was in Simpsons Racing on an Open Fire, but this would be his first appearance since then. So, yeah. So. <laughs> and so, he forms together an army of kids to fight back against Nelson with Grandpa Simpson's help and the help of Herman, the owner of the military antique store, who we meet in this episode for the first time. But don't go on a warpath if you see this episode. It's just an entertaining thrill ride. In Moaning Lisa, Lisa's feeling too sad to do anything and this includes playing dodgeball. So she sent home with a behaviour report for that. And yes, in case you're wondering, the title is a play on the Mona Lisa. So... <laughs> and Marge then ends up learning just to let Lisa be sad instead of trying to make her happy again. After all attempts to cheer her up fail. But though, don't go getting blue just by seeing this episode. It's still a good one. In the Call of the Simpsons, Homer buys a run-down, shabby RV in order to try and compete with Flanders' top-of-the-range one. And this would be the Flanders' first appearance in the show. No, it wouldn't. First appearance in the show since the first episode. And this, uh, Homer takes his family on a trip in the water, in the wilderness, in this shabby RV, only to then end up destroying the vehicle, and Homer being mistaken for Bigfoot. Oh, hilarious! How oh, that could happen to Homer. Oh, yes. Okay. Go wild with this episode. It's one of the best in the season. In the Telltale Head, Bart takes the head off the Springfield Town statue to make a gang of bullies like him. And this ends up with him trying to flee from an angry mob while trying to return the head. Homer helps him, of course, after he owns up to it. And it's a pretty telltale episode. You should definitely give it a watch. In Life on the Fast Lane, 
Homer gives Marge a bowling ball as a birthday present. And this leads her to take up bowling as a new hobby, where she meets Jack, a professional bowler who teaches her how to bowl. And yes, okay. I think I'll leave the description of the episode here and say that you'll get bowled over if you watch this episode. It's a great one. In Homer's night out, Homer goes out for a boy's night out. When a stag dude comes up for one of his colleagues, his supervisor. And this then leads, because in this episode Bart also gets a spy camera. This leads Bart to take a photo of Homer dancing with a floozy named Princess Cashmere. Which then leads to Marge throwing Homer out of the house. For the first time in the series history. And this then culminates in Bart trying to, or Homer trying to teach Bart about how bad it is to objectify women. Even though he was doing that himself. Okay. In the Crepes of Rock, oh, sorry, sorry, my opinion of the episode. It is, um, it's okay. It's, a, it's an okay episode. It's... You know, that, yeah. So in the Crepes of Wrath, after a prank gone horribly wrong, flushing a cherry bomb down the toilet, makes a stall with Agnes Skinner, whose first appearance it is in this episode, explode. Homer recommends a foreign exchange program, which means Bart is sent to France, while the Simpsons get an Albanian boy for three months. And while Bart's in France, he is treated horribly by his exchange or his foster parents, who just turn out to be evil. He's in a country where at first he speaks no French, so he doesn't speak their language, until something happens to make him speak it. And it is a good episode, and yes, the title is a play on the Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And I also forgot to mention that The Telltale Head is a play on The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. And Call of the Simpsons is a play on Call of the Wild. But I can't tell you who that's by. But anyway, moving on. To my opinion of the Crepes of Wrath, it's okay. It's not one of the best episodes of the series. <laughs> okay. In Krusty Gets Busted, Krusty, he makes his first appearance in this show by the way, in this episode, um, is arrested for an armed robbery. And we later find out that it was his assistant, Sideshow Bob, who also makes his first appearance in this show, proper. In this episode. Because he wanted revenge. So he, was, he framed Krusty by dressing up as him and robbing the Quickie Mart. And it's down to Bart and Lisa and Maggie's detective skills to clear Krusty's name, which they do. And this episode is actually a good lesson on jumping to the wrong conclusions and falsely accusing people of doing something they haven't done. You shouldn't do that. So... That's why it's one of my favourite episodes. Not of just this season, but of the whole series. And finally, in some enchanted evening, Homer and Marge go out on a date. Well, they just go out for the evening, leaving the kids in charge 
of a babysitter called Mrs. Bot, Miss Bots, who turns out to be the babysitter bandit. Oh my word! She actually imprisons the kids by tying them up and forcing them to watch Happy Little Elves. Much to bastards, mate. And okay guys, now a little bit of information that you might be unaware of about this episode. It was actually supposed to be the pilot. Yeah, this episode was supposed to be the pilot episode. <laughs> so... But it got pushed back to the end of the season. <laughs> because obviously the actual pilot ended up being the Christmas episode we've already talked about. So... And it is a brilliant way to end the first season. As a whole, the season is good in places and okay in others, but there isn't a bad episode in the bunch. So... And if you have any nostalgic memories of watching this season on TV as it originally aired, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching and have us a magical time.